you haven't started, you, you can now. So I'm going to explain how to, how to do this for you guys, and you, we just did the sample, but now I'm going to the next column. So go to column two, and you're going to be getting that information from paragraphs 10 to 12. So you're gonna be looking at paragraphs 10 to 12, and in this case, you'll notice there's a scribble out in the middle because you don't need to add anything to that, that claim. Remember that the middle is the claim? And here we have, President Obama believes that students decide the future of our country. So now you have to think of what is a counterclaim that you could give for that? What would a negative Nelly or negative Nancy say about, oh, President Obama believes students decide the future of our country, but I think, how, what, what, what could you say? Well, and I'll answer it because I know we're recording. Oh, but I think that no matter what you do, nothing will ever make a difference in your life. That's like the counterclaim. So you'd say, some people say, you know, some people think that you'll never make a difference. You know, you'll never change your status in life. So you're thinking about what would a negative person say in response to President Obama's claim. So you have to sort of like know the claim before you can make the counterclaim or know the counterclaim before you can make the claim. And that's why I've scribbled out the places that you don't need to write anything because I think a lot of people were confused by the blank spaces. So if it's scribbled, you don't write anything. Question, yes? Um, do we have to write the same counterclaim? No, you do not have to do my counterclaim. As long as you understand what it is to do, you can do any counterclaim. So now that I have the counterclaim and the claim, I'm going to look in paragraphs 10 to 12, and I'm gonna look for quotations from the text that show President Obama saying that we decide the future of our country. So maybe I'll use the quote, we need every one of you to develop your talent and your skills. So then that would be my quote, you know, we need, I'm not gonna do the whole thing. And then I would cite it. What page is um, paragraph 10 on? Is it still 69? Yeah, so it would be Obama, 69 parentheses, then the period goes after the citation. So you need to find two of those, okay? So in the last pages, you'll see that maybe the counterclaim is there. You need to come up with the claim. So let's look at that last example and we'll keep filming so I can show that example too. So in the, on the back page, I'm gonna give you all the paragraph numbers. Excuse me, thank you. I'm gonna give you all the paragraph numbers to make it easier for you to do this. Don't say I never gave you nothing. So ultimately, you're gonna be responsible for doing all this. I'm just modeling for you how it's done. In this case, we have a claim. I'm sorry, we have a counterclaim. Kids have too many obstacles that get in the way of education. And it's sort of like what you should think of it. It's sort of like there's like an implied but. It's like kids believe this, but President Obama believes this, right? Exactly. So ultimately you have to say, well, if this is the counterclaim, God, too many obstacles that get in the way. What does President Obama say about that? And where you're gonna get that information is in paragraphs 13 through 18. You're gonna look at what does he have to say about it and you're gonna come up with a claim. You know, but President Obama believes that no matter what your obstacles are, you have to try hard in school. So you're looking specifically in these paragraphs, paragraphs 13 through 18. And then you're finding quotes from paragraphs 13 and 18, and you're citing them with the author and page number. Same with here, there's no counterclaim, but there's a claim, President Obama believes you make your own future. Now you gotta figure out what the counterclaim is. What would a negative Nancy say about making your own future? Oh, some kids think that where they are born is where they're gonna be for the rest of their life, but, Remember, it's sort of like there's an implied but. But President Obama believes this, and then you find quotes for it. So you're filling out this whole paper, but what I wanna do is give you the last bits of paragraphs. So you should have these paragraph numbers written just like I do here. So if you haven't, then that's gonna be difficult for you to complete this. But this is paragraphs 13 through 18, and then this is paragraphs 19 through 25. And this is paragraphs um, 28 to 30. Okay, so now I've given you all the paragraphs that are for each thing. It's also gonna be on this paper up here, but you can't take the quotes, but if you need help with the paragraphs. 
Um, and ultimately, you need to fill out this entire sheet and turn it in before the end of class. You guys all have enough time to do it, so you'll only get full credit if you turn it in before the end of class, I've decided. Okay. Okay, so today we're going to be learning about rhetorical appeals. And we looked at the Obama speech last class, and we learned about how he used rhetoric in order to convince us to do something. And what did he want to convince us to do? In this case, he wanted us to do something good with our lives. He wanted us to try hard in school and think about where our place was in the future. Today, we're going to take notes off of this PowerPoint, so you should be following along with what's on the screen, and you'll be filling in all the blanks. So let me, and you can just stay kind of pointed at the screen is fine. So what is rhetoric? Let's look. Rhetoric is the art of using language to persuade, influence beliefs, and or achieve a desired purpose. So the point of rhetoric is that it uses language to persuade or influence. And let's see, can you double it? Can you take one for our lovely filmographer as well? Can you take double the notes? Oh, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. So the first fill in the blank would be language. The art of using what? Oh, actually, I'm sorry, There's there was one before. I see why you guys are confused, it's my fault. Uh, the first, there are three types of appeals. The three types of appeals are ethos, pathos, and logos. That's the first notes that you take. So the three types of appeals are ethos, pathos, and logos. Yeah, and he's writing it for you, so the filmographer is all covered. Fancy, she gets her notes written for her. It's like an assistant, you know? <laughs> so the three types of appeals, ethos, pathos, and logos. And that's what we're gonna be learning about today. So those are the first notes that you should have taken. Did everyone fill those in? No. Okay, you should fill in ethos, pathos, and logos. Okay, what is rhetoric? That's where I said rhetoric is the art of using language. It's the art of using language to persuade, influence beliefs, and or achieve a desired purpose. So you'll be filling in the blank, the art of using language to persuade, influence, beliefs or achieve a desired purpose. And why must we learn this? Why, why? Well, you gotta learn this because we live in a dog eat dog world. It is a play or get played world where people are going to try to manipulate you. People are going to try to tell you how to think, how to feel, what to buy, who to vote for, how to act, what to wear. And your job as discerning thinkers is to figure out how are they trying to play me? How are they trying to get me to do what they want? How are they trying to persuade me? How are they using language to influence my beliefs? And once you realize how language is being used, you're better able to recognize when you're being manipulated. And you can be manipulated for good or bad. Let's look at some rhetoric that's around us. This next page, you don't need to take notes. You just should be listening and watching what I'm referencing. So rhetoric is all around us. You'll see it in advertising. Look at this advertisement Michelin because so much is riding on your tires and what's what's in the picture oh cute, oh, cute little baby well I see that and as a mom and I know that and other parents would agree they see that they go oh my gosh I never considered how so much was riding on my tires if I cheap out on tires I might as well just be killing my baby if I don't buy the right tires I will end up killing my child in my cheapness. <gasps> I must get new tires right now to the Michelin <laughs> store. Or there if you don't you go. go out and buy new tires that day, the next time you're at Sears or wherever you get your tires, and they say, oh, do you want the cheap ones or do you want the nice Michelin ones? You're gonna be like, oh, that baby, I could have saved his life. It's too late for him, but it won't be too late for me. I'll take the Michelin, sir, yes. Put it on three credit cards. Evenly distributed. So you'll see in advertising, and again, like I said, it's not going to be something instantaneous, but something that kind of settles in your mind, and then you start thinking about it as as time goes. 
You'll see it's in politics a lot. You guys aren't ready to vote yet, but soon you'll have that power. And you're going to have politicians rallying for your vote. You know, they, they kiss the cute babies, they shake the hands, they take the selfies. But ultimately, whoever it is, Republican, Democrat, Independent, whatever the things are, you are going to have to decide between them. How are they gonna get you to do that? By using language, the art of rhetoric, to persuade. So ultimately, looking around us and recognizing how rhetoric is used in politics will make us stronger citizens, will make us stronger voters. Lastly, you guys use rhetoric in your everyday life. Think about asking your parents to borrow a car. You have to convince them, once you guys have your license, you have to convince them that they are, that you're trustworthy. And you must learn this because, so you don't get played. So you gotta learn it so you don't get played. You might ask your parents to borrow the car and you might say like, um, Dad, in the last three months, I've received all A's in all my classes and I've maintained that GPA while going to softball and volleyball practice. May I please borrow the car because look how responsible I am. So there you're using logos, right? Trying to convince them of something. If you are maybe buying a car, you might use logos to get them to give you a better deal. Oh, well, um, Mr. Dealer, sir, this car is on sale three miles away for this price, and this car is on sale 12 miles away, so you might as well give me the same price that they're getting. Logic, right? So you use rhetoric all the time, and today we're going to look a little bit more into detail about what those three types of rhetoric are. And the next, each slide after this, you should be filling in the blanks. So if you have fallen behind, you can look at your, your partner's page. The first, here you go, the first, um, thing that you need to know about rhetoric is why. Why do you have to learn it? What's the point? Why would you want to learn about rhetoric? Well, it helps us become more attentive, discerning interpreters of the world around us. It makes us aware of how people are messing with us. So did everyone get this first one? I think some people might want some company over there. It also helps us recognize and practice sound, and persuasive arguments. It also helps us spot empty talk. If someone is manipulating us, we'll be able to tell better once we're experts at rhetoric. It also will allow us to write and speak more effectively and more persuasively. Whether you're writing emails or essays, whether you're negotiating a purchase or you're presenting something for college or high school, you will be a stronger person because of your knowledge of rhetoric. It'll also help you dis discuss and debate with vigor and intelligence. So often, especially in today's world, people fight, but their answers are like, uh, just cause. Well, that's just cause, that's, just, that's how it is. That's what I think. But you, if you wanna be taken seriously in the real world by real you know, people with an education, have to be able to speak effectively and persuasively and you have to make sure that you're not just doing empty talk. Oh yeah, well, you're stupid, that's what I think. Yeah, wanna know more? It's like, that's not actually gonna take you very far in life. Instead, you have to know how to be someone who utilizes rhetoric to get what you want and to help people understand you. Um, there's kind of a boring history of rhetoric that I won't get into. That is that, some old white guy named Aristotle decided that he would call these three uh, parts of a triangle the triangle of rhetoric. And he named it ethos, pathos, and logos. And he was a philosopher who really thought about how people use language to make their point and how that, that was able to control the masses, essentially. So we have those three types, ethos, pathos, logos. What are the rhetorical appeals? Well, like we said, they're persuasive strategies used in arguments to support claims and to respond to opposing arguments. If you, if you were talking and distracted and you missed a couple lines, then you can just pick up where we are and then we'll come back to it. So we should be over by persuasive. What are rhetorical appeals after the history of rhetoric? 
about halfway middle of the page. What are rhetorical appeals? Persuasive strategies used in arguments to support claims. Respond to opposing arguments. And a strong argument is going to use a combination of the appeals to make its case. Okay, so it's going to be a combination of the three appeals or one or two appeals that's going to be the most effective. Okay, let's take notes on logos. So we're on logos, which is at the bottom of the page, logos. Logos is an appeal to logic or reason. Logos provides audience members with facts, evidence, and statistics in order to persuade them. So you're writing on your paper an appeal to logic or reason. Provides audience with facts and statistics. Can you in the margins put the following hashtags? Hashtag facts, hashtag stats, Hashtag dats, short for data. Hashtag logic and hashtag duh. Can you add those somewhere in the margins? The margins are the edges of your paper. So just add those in the margins next to logos. Where it says logos, write these hashtags. I like to think in these hashtags because it helps us categorize these three appeals. We're going to have to categorize these for the rest of our academic career. So we might as well think about them in the, in the most simple way. Logos is all about numbers, it's all about data, it's all about statistics. And then you can just pause the, the camera right there. Logic, reason, data, statistics, science, that's what Logos is about. Logos is about convincing your audience to do something, not with emotion. If you could take your AirPods out please and not be trying to talk to other people, that would be amazing. Like I said, logic has to do, logos has to do with logic, and it's really more of a scientific approach. Let's look at this ad, for example. Flonase allergy relief outperforms the leading allergy pill. As opposed to most over-the-counter allergy pills, Flonase helps block six allergic substances, not just one. And then it shows this very scientific looking, kind of like bionic, robotic person. You know, notice it's not like a hot woman or like a handsome man. It has no gender, it has no race. It's just like kind of robotic because the point of logos, and everyone should be directing their attention to the screen because that's just where the information is coming from. The point of logos when they're using that in advertisements is to convince you using purely logic and reason-based methods. So not only does it tell you that in a, in a clinical trial it outperforms an allergy pill, it also tells you specifically what things it blocks from. It has very scientific drawings of it. It also has some data here, like, you know, it box six versus two. And then it has this lovely drawing. Like I said, there's no gender or any like personality. It's just meant to be uh, like in a science book, like a, a graphic and it has this person and oh no, look, there are all these allergens around them. But what is this medicine doing? It's blocking it. And so it's trying to give you all these different methods to convince you to get this product using logos. Now think about it, this product could have been sold using pathos, right? They could have said, okay, great. This is how we're gonna sell it to the old folks, but how are we gonna sell it to the youngsters? How do we get those 21 year olds to buy that Flonase? And maybe the advertising men are like, I know, let's just throw pathos all over it. Let's make them have to get the Flonase or else their love life is at stake. Let's hit them where it hurts, their heart. What if, what if a girl, she, she just, I'd love to go to the dance with you. Oh, I, I didn't even know you knew my name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm fine. No, that was just uh, the TV. No, I'm. I'd love to go. I'll see you soon. Okay, bye. Oh, Bob, I, uh, I just got invited to the. I just got invited to the dance. <laughs> I'm so excited. Do I look okay? And what if the mom's like, oh honey, you should take Flonase. It outperforms the leading allergy pill and it's definitely gonna make your date a much more enjoyable experience. What if I was like, no, it's okay. I'm good. 
<laughs> I'm good. I don't even like take aspirin. Like I'm good. I don't need to. I don't need to take anything. And then what if she's on her date and the date takes her to like the cheesecake factory or something beforehand? And what if she orders spaghetti but she's wearing all white? Oh no. And the date is asking her what her major is going to be in in college, and she's like, it's going to be. <laughs> and the date's like, oh, oh, you're disgusting. You're a monster. My grandma got me this suit, and she's dead. And you're like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I'm so, I know you'll never grow up, Nick, and just delete my number. I'm sorry. I do, I do. And then she gets home, and she's like eating popcorn, and she's like ice cream too, maybe some Snickers on the side. She's like, Mom, I do, I had, I do. The worst day ever, at you? And the mom's like, well, honey, you should have gotten Flonase. It outperforms the leading allergy pill, six to one. And then you just see the girl and she's like 80, just living with her cats. And then she dies and her cats eat her body and they don't find her for weeks. Oh, wow. And now you're really motivated to buy Flonase. You should have bought the Flonase. You could have met the love of your life. You could have had a great time. You could have gone on to get married and have beautiful babies, but instead, She's dying with her cats. And so that's how you could take something that was previously Logos and say, we're gonna sell it one way with Logos, how could we sell it with Pathos? And then if it was Ethos, it would be like Beyonce, being like, hey, I use Flonays every day and you should too if you wanna be fab like me. And then they were like, yes, I love Beyonce. I'm part of the Beehive, I'll buy that, sure. And again, you can take the same product and sell it in different ways. So that's an example of Logos. Let, and then example of, of the next one that I'm going to talk about, which is pathos. So pathos, like I just performed for you, is an appeal to emotion. It really tries to evoke an emotional response in the audience, and that could be a positive one or a negative one. So it could be something that's exciting and inspiring and hashtag motivational, or it could be something that makes us scared or makes us nervous. So for the hashtag for pathos, let's do hashtag inspire, hashtag motivate, hashtag emotion. Someone said it last time, it was really good, emotional blackmail. Um, why are we blackmailing? Because corporations are going to be telling you in all these different ways, you're not good enough. Here's how your life could be better. Here's how you could be happier. Here's how people will like you more. Here's how people will think you're more pretty and attractive. And that's all emotionally manipulating us in order to think about what, you know, how our lives are deficient because we're not buying those products or we're not voting for that person or we're not, you know, going to that event. Pathos is really about that, it's tugging at your heartstrings for better or for worse. Uh, one example of uh, the hashtags are hashtag inspire, hashtag motivate, hashtag emotional blackmail. So pathos, it can be used for good, like in a, I'm sorry, not for good, not like Coca-Cola is a good company, but like it could be used to make you feel good and it can also be used to make you feel bad. But in both cases, you're doing something. Have you guys seen those? Sarah McLaughlin commercials, right? It's like, in the arms of the angels, far away. And you're like, <laughs> I'm so sorry that the, the doggies are dying here. Have all my money. There you go. Just make all the money. Just make it rain and money. And you're like, I gotta save Otis. Maybe they have manipulated you via your guilt or your fear. My sister Cassie saw oh, that commercial. And she just probably her. wanted to donate yeah, right yeah, away, she probably, right? She like, she like got the phone and was like, and you're like, I've got to save these animals, yeah, she, right? She had, she wanted to save the animals. Exactly. So being that you want to save the animals or being that you want to make the, a difference in their lives, you will be motivated to buy pedigree dog food. Now, are you going to just drop everything and be like, I got to go, Miss Tucker. I have a dog to save. <laughs> Otis, I'm coming for you. I got to buy that pedigree dog food. I'm going, no, because maybe you don't have a dog right now. Maybe you're not at a dog food. But 
subconsciously. If you see that advertisement enough, next time you're in the shopping, you know, the aisle that has all the different pet food and you're like, okay, well I gotta, it's illegal to starve my dog to death, you know? So the cops told me at least. So gotta buy it some dog food. Which dog food should I buy? Oh yeah, pedigree. It saves lives every time I buy a bag. Eh, might as well buy this. I'm a hero. I just saved a dog's life. And as you drop it into the shopping cart, you're like, wow, I'm a really good person. Not all heroes wear capes. Some just buy dog food. And it's like, nothing actually changed when you bought that thing of dog food, but you thinking of it is an emotional response. Yes, question. Okay, so you say that it's illegal to starve your dog, but these commercials, they record the dog and they look so sick. And oh, unhealthy. how do they make them look so yeah, sad? Yeah. Do... I think there's really good dog actors out there. I know there's dogs who are trained to, you know, they look sad for a second, but then they're richer than all of us, you know, <laughs> being driven around in Teslas and stuff. <laughs> Buy a Tesla. <laughs> um, so we can make us feel guilty or it can make us feel happy. Either way, it does what they want us to do, which is buy the product. Let's look at ethos. Ethos is an appeal to character and credibility. And ethos, we talked a little bit about it last class, is really about convincing the audience that the speaker is reliable. Can you trust the speaker? Do you want to take advice from them? And with ethos, they're gonna say like, yeah, you do wanna take advice from me. Here's why, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a dentist, I'm a teacher, I'm a mother. One type of ethos is they convince us via who they are as experts. Oh, I have a degree in writing, therefore you should buy these pens. Oh, I'm a mother, therefore you should buy these diapers. You know, I'm a security guard, therefore you should buy this taser. You know, like whatever it is that they're experts in, they are looking to convince us through their expertise. In this case, we have a dentist, right? Dr. Alexander Smith. It says she's a dentist, she's in her white coat. So we're like, oh yes, I know you. You're a doctor, I trust you. Oh, you wanna sell me toothpaste? Of course, I'd love to buy, you know, denti the dentist recommended toothpaste. Are you gonna buy toothpaste from like Bob on the street who's like, hey, you should brush your teeth. Do you have any change? Yeah. Also use Sensodyne. And you're like, you don't even have any teeth. Why are you giving me advice? Like, <laughs> what kind of toothpaste to buy? Whereas a dentist with beautiful teeth and she's super smart and she has that white coat so you know she's a real doctor, right? That then motivates us. We'll buy it from you if you tell us to. You Bob on the street? Probably not. But Dr. Alexander Smith, yeah, definitely. Another way you can have ethos in an advertisement or in any sort of writing is kind of less earned and it's by celebrities. So Jennifer Anderson, she's a Rachel from Friends, she doesn't actually know the composition of water, I bet. I bet she couldn't tell you what electrolytes are going in and what the production process is. She probably couldn't tell you how it was bottled or how this water compares to any other water that you might get from the store or a sink. But by God, she's hot. And guys wanna be with her and girls wanna be her. So why not buy the water that Jennifer Aniston's buying? If she is this gorgeous and clean and happy and she drinks smart water, well then maybe if I drink smart water, I might be a little bit more like those things. Now, we don't even know if she drinks smart water, right? And even if she does, does it affect anything that we're seeing here? No, right? She's a millionaire, she has personal trainers, she's being airbrushed in this photo, like hashtag lots of filters. So when you see experts endorse products, it's not because they're actual experts, like education-wise, it's because they're celebrities that have that brand recognition. Okay, so those are the three three types of rhetorical appeals. This should complete your entire uh, paper and if you don't have it, I'm gonna put the answers up on